you can stop sharing. Miho, you have the floor. Good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to the seventh session of the UNCTAD Trade Policy Dialogue. My name is Miho Shirotori. I'm the officer in charge of the Division on International Trade and Commodities of UNCTAD. The UNCTAD Trade Policy Dialogue is a forum for the UNCTAD delegates, trade policy makers in the capital and the global developmental community. The idea is to have candid policy discussion on hot contemporary topics of international and regional trade policy from a developmental perspective the topic we are discussing today is how different regions are improving transparency and regulatory cooperation with a view to reducing negative impact of non-tariff barriers upon trade, particularly trade among developing countries. We only have one hour today. So without further ado, I would like to invite the moderator, Mr. Ralph Peters, to take us through the panel discussion. Ralph is the head of the UNCTAD program on non-tariff measures or NTMs. So over to you, Ralph. Thank you, Miho. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, um, everybody. I welcome all panelists and all participants. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Uh, we have a keynote uh, address and five speakers today. Uh, and we will discuss about non-tariff measures um, to prepare the ground for the discussion of the um, 15th uh, ministerial meeting of UNCTAD, which takes place in uh, Barbados from the 3rd to 7th of October, unfortunately virtually. Um, and uh, I have a uh, few uh, housekeeping uh, issues to say. First of all, if you have any comments or questions, um, you can write them in the uh, question and answer window at the bottom of uh, your screen, possibly. Um, and then uh, we will read them out and uh, they will be uh, then answered and addressed. Um, the second uh, comment is an important one. Um, we have one speaker who will speak in Russian and it will be simultaneously um, translated into English, but you have to choose uh, the English channel. So. At the bottom of your screen, you see a globe, and uh, there you have to choose the English channel if you want to listen in English. And uh, perhaps you do this already now, because otherwise, if you don't choose actively the English channel, you will not hear anything when the uh, interpreter speaks. Um, so we have uh, one speaker. Um, that uh, will then speak in, in Russian, and that's uh, Mr. Kutman, and uh, um, I'm welcoming Gregory um, to translate this um, into English. Um, we will start with the keynote address by the Secretary General of Aladi, uh, Mr. Sergio Abreu Bonilla, um, after which we will then have some discussion with the panelists. Um, the panelists are um, Mr. Silva Oyakol. He is the Chief of Staff at the AFCFTA Secretariat. He is a trade economist and has extensive experience in trade policy and trade development. He participated um, in several negotiations and he has been at the forefront of the efforts to eliminate uh, non-tariff barriers to trade at the regional level. Um, Mrs. Mariam Gabunia, she's the head of Department of Foreign Trade and International Economic Relations at the Ministry of Economic Development, Georgia, in Georgia. Um, she oversees the trade negotiations and coordination of the EU, um, Georgia Free Trade Agreement, and the Implementation Division, uh, as well as the Division on WTO Affairs. Um, Mr. Zong Nguyen, uh, he's the director at the Department for General Economic Issues and Integration Studies at the Central Institute for Economic Management in Vietnam. He is an economist and Vietnam's official representative to the IPEC Forum leading APEC structural reform agenda. Um, Mr. Uh, Kali Bikov Kutman, 
He is the head of the ICT department, uh, or single window center for foreign trade in the Ministry of Economy and Finance in the Kyrgyz Republic. He is a software engineer and he has extensive experience in trade facilitation and customs procedures. And Mr. Cameroon Raid, he is the acting assistant secretary um, in the Pacific Economic and Trade Branch um, in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Australia. He's an economist and he has worked in Australia's Agency for International Development, as well as for the OECD. So before we come to the discussion, I'm pleased to have the SG of Aladi giving a keynote. Um, Antel has a very long-standing partnership with Aladi. Um, we had to record with Sergio Abro's message and we will show the message now. It's a very short uh, video message um, in Spanish, but it has subtitles in English. Um, over to you, Malek. Please uh, show the video. En primer lugar, un saludo a la organización, a la UNTA y esta reunión organizada con un tema tan importante previo a la conferencia ministerial del de mes de octubre. El mensaje de la LADI tiene que ser claro y directo. El comercio es la vía en el que el empleo y la dignidad personal se concreta en todo el planeta y en particular en todas las regiones. La UNTA tiene una muy eh, significativa actividad que desarrollar. Y en este semestre, o en esta instancia, estamos hablando de la transparencia y sobre todo de la importancia de los aspectos regulatorios del comercio internacional. Por un lado estamos eh, viendo la promoción del comercio en lo que son el abatimiento tradicional de los aranceles, pero ahora las medidas no arancelarias, las normas regulatorias y todas aquellas políticas que se toman por varios países, ya sea desarrollados, o en vías de desarrollo, necesitan transparencia y evitar que hoy las normas se transformen en restricciones no arancelarias, en particular para las pequeñas y medianas empresas. Por eso, así como apostamos a las reglas de juego, a la estabilidad normativa, a lo que es la equidad en las negociaciones de carácter comercial, también desde la LADI, desde esta región que hoy es la más desigual del planeta, podemos encontrar dignidad a través del comercio y del empleo. Y eso es con transparencia el esfuerzo y el aporte que van a hacer todos ustedes y nosotros, que desde la Secretaría General vamos a aportar un esfuerzo técnico, pero también político en lo que significa la creatividad y la capacidad de propuesta para encontrar este objetivo que los países deben compartir y desarrollar para encontrar comercio, mayor justicia social y transparencia en particular en todo lo que es el nuevo mundo de la globalización y la inserción de la economía internacional. Muchas gracias, los felicito y quedo como siempre a la orden. Thank you, Malik. Um, so, um... The SG of Aladi, he um, emphasized the importance of uh, non-tariff measures. And we have here the two elements um, that he mentioned. One is um, the trade cost aspect. So he mentioned uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, which are particularly affected. But he also mentioned the importance of uh, non-tariff measures um, and the um, non-trade objectives uh, of, of non-tariff measures. Um, so with this, um, I would like to open the discussion with our panelists. And uh, I see that one panelist had some uh, challenges joining us. So um, I will uh, change the order. So uh, Mr. Silva from the AFC FTA Secretariat um, was not able yet to, to join us. So I would like to um, start uh, the discussion then with you, Mariam. Um, Mariam, um, what are your challenges with non-tariff measures and what are the instruments that you are using to address them? Um, so if you um, would like to start, please. 
Okay, thank you, thank you, Ralph. So if I will start, it is my great pleasure to be a speaker of this panel session and to address such a distinguished audience. I hope that we will have truly fruitful and productive discussions today. In today's world, it is very important to create stable, predictable and attractive business environment. This goal, among others, can be achieved by removal of non-tariff barriers to trade through further improvement of border crossing and other, other administrative procedures like TBT and SPS measures, developing of transport infrastructure and decreasing of transportation costs. With that regard, I would like to share Georgia's experience, which pursues one of the most liberal trade policies worldwide with zero import duties on 80% of goods, simplified customs procedures, and dramatically reduced non-tariff regulations. With that, we are in line with almost all obligations under the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement. It has to be highlighted that Georgia has implemented 93% of all the provisions before the agreements entry into force. This was made possible by the government's persistent efforts to consolidate a paperless trading system. Speaking of customs reforms in particular, I would like to emphasize that Georgian customs has been distinguished with the successful and effective reforms being recognized in the international customs community. Reforms to date have involved modernization of customs administration through the integration of tax procedures and border control functions into one single agency revenue service under the Ministry of Finance. Customs modernization efforts have also involved the introduction of UNCTAD automated system for customs data, a so-called ASIUDA, which supports the full automation of customs clearance procedures using international standards. Reforms we are directed towards minimizing time spent on customs formalities and procedures and decreasing import, export, and transit documentation requirements and also simplifying the business processes through, uh, for example, conduction of all border crossing related procedures based on one-stop shop principle, development of risk management system into customs control, introduction of coordinated border management practices while introducing interagency cooperation and collaboration with neighboring countries, online issuance of all trade documents through national paperless trading system, construction of so-called customs clearance zones on different regions of Georgia, giving the possibility to the economic agents to benefit from one-stop stop principle in non-stop regime. It has to be highlighted that all reforms that government implement with regard of trade policy are mostly driven by the commitments under the new Georgia DCFTA. Reforms are underway in all trade-related areas including SPS and TBT, where we are approximating our legislation to EU acquis. In that process, government actively supports private sector to adapt to new requirements. One of the main obstacles for SMEs to be engaged in international trade is underdeveloped quality infrastructure, metrology standardization, testing and quality assurance. In order to support private sector, including SMEs, in accessing the world markets, Georgia is putting many efforts to develop quality infrastructure in line with best international practices. First time in the region, five metrological laboratories have gained European international recognition, and we are now providing relevant services not only to local companies, but also to our neighbors. Georgian Accreditation Center has signed bilateral recognition agreement with the European Accreditation which reduces technical barriers for Georgian products on international markets and contributes to the growth of competitiveness of the products produced in Georgia through reducing the cost of certification. Georgia has adopted more than 18,000 international and EU standards as national standards. An electronic platform for distribution of standards has also been introduced. One of the primary objectives for the government of Georgia is to support private sector, including SMEs, in order to raise competitiveness 
and new, meet new SPS and GBT requirements through relevant state programs and policies. We stimulate growth of Georgian SMEs through use of financial and non-financial instruments and programs, including entrepreneur learning, increased access to finance, business skill development, export and investment promotion, consultancy, and so on. In conclusion, let me highlight that all these reforms and many others were well reflected in UNEC study on regulatory and procedural barriers to trade in Georgia, that showcased Georgia as one of the top reformers in the region. Study provided valuable and action-oriented recommendations on further development of Georgia's trade policy and practices. And I would like to use this opportunity and once again thank UNEC team for that. Thank you very much for your attention. That was very briefly. Thank you very much, uh, Mariam. You mentioned a couple of points. Um, that were very interesting. One is um, you made the link to the um, of the regulations to the customs procedures, um, which I think is very important. So you um, uh, went into some uh, details of how you simplified the custom procedures, including using um, the, the UNCTAD software ASICUDA um, at the customs. Um, a second point you made was um, emphasis of the uh, trade policy reforms. Um, including SPS and TBT uh, measures um, to approximate uh, those of your trading partners. And you mentioned here the EU um, are key, um, which, which plays an important role for you. So I think this is a, a remarkable point um, in terms of, uh, you know, um, harmonizing its own regulations with those of the main trading partners. Um, you also mentioned uh, that you are developing the quality infrastructure that is very important uh, for exporters um, so that they meet the requirements in demanding markets. Um, so you, you build the um, development uh, here um, to enhance the quality infrastructure. Um, you mentioned international standards, which is, I think, an important element, um, again, uh, which goes into the direction of regulatory cooperation, uh, because international standards then um, uh, um, enhances uh, the acceptance of, of your goods in, in your trading partners uh, uh, markets. Um, and the, the aim here, um, you mentioned uh, the private sector um, and to strengthen their competitiveness. So that is, um, uh, course, with a view um, uh, also to you know, strengthen their markets, uh, their, their, their export opportunities. Um, so uh, this is something which um, I think is important because non-tariff measures are normally mostly import measures, but um, they have to be um, uh, designed in a smart way, um, including to, uh, to strengthen the competitiveness of the, the companies. Um, finally, you also mentioned uh, our colleagues from UNECE. Um, they are doing um, really great work on assessing and analyzing trade regulations. And um, uh, I hope our colleagues are also here from UNECE. Um, they are doing great work um, in, in Georgia and some other countries in um, East Europe and, and Central Asia. Thank you, Mariam. Um, if I uh, could ask Zong, um, uh, Zong from uh, Vietnam, could you please? Uh, Come in to the discussion. Uh, good morning. Good, mo good, good morning. morning. From Hanoi. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, and uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon again from Hanoi. Before I start, I would like to thank the Antat for the invitation to speak today. And uh, I also like, would like to share my perspective as a researcher. Uh, of doing uh, work on NPMs in, uh, in Vietnam. Uh, so far, I think we basically in the uh, we uh, in the in the late 1990s and early 2000s, uh, Vietnam has started the pro process toward uh, trade liberalizations, and we in doing so we aim to focus more on the NPBs. And we and what we did was to replace the NPB with the tariff trade, and we call it the tar tarification process. But since 2008, just shortly after the WTO accession, we start to resume the use of the NTMs to restrain imports. And the talks about the NTMs became more prevalent since 2011, when we adopt the program to stabilize the macro environment 
And in that process, we also emphasize the measures to improve the import ma management. And until now, Vietnam has no official program uh, to target the NPM. Uh, we, has not, not, uh, we haven't got any official classification of NPM in the country either. But, uh, but in the past year, we had several strong efforts to streamline the regulations related to trade, including the NPMs. The first thing is we <clears throat> attempted to uh, promote accessibility to regulations. And most legal documents now in Vietnam are widely and freely accessible uh, through legal portals, whether it's from the uh, government, from the National Assembly, or, or, or the, provided by the private companies. Uh, the adoption of the good regulatory practice under the law on legal normative documents, including those like regulatory impact assessment, public consultations, also improve the transparency of regulations in, uh, and the rulemaking process. And secondly, uh, during the 2000s and 2013, uh, we had very few efforts to promote trade liberalization and NPM reduction beyond the commitments. Uh, but uh, so devising the, uh, so we had to de devise a strategy to streamline the NPMs in Vietnam by a more indirect approach. So we, we do, uh, in, the, in terms of the entry point, we had no program to target the NPMs. But the government of Vietnam has prioritized a program to improve the ease of doing business. And uh, among the measures uh, were, uh, uh, was the reduction of the unnecessary regulatory burden on business. So we start to consult the, uh, the companies, we start to collect evidence. And in early 2015, the CIM, which is my institute, reviewed the business conditions in various law and uh, they start to table a proposal to remove about 3,000 of the business conditions, including trade-related conditions. And in 2017, uh, we also submit another proposal, proposal to the government to remove or simplify about 2,000 business-related conditions, and, uh, and many of which are effectively NPMs. And the third life effort was the international regulatory cooperations. And uh, so in early 2016, uh, we start to have the first comprehensive database on NPMs prepared jointly by the, by the CIM under the leadership of the ANTAP and AREA, which is the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. In late 2019, uh, AREA and ANTAP provide the second set of NPM database covering regulations until March 2018. And with the support from ANTAP, uh, we are also updating the database until September of last year. And I believe that the database it will be about to release very soon. And the, we, it should be noted that one factor underlying the NPM collection process was the NPM work program ASEAN. In 2012, the, uh, in Cambodia, uh, ASEAN had uh, the NPM work program and it, and it provides for the establishment of the national NPM committees and with the task of collect and classifying the regulations on NPM, developing the guideline on, uh, on operating procedures for each NPM, notifying the NPM inventory to the secretariat, and publish NPM in the web portal, including the National Trade Repository and the ASEAN Trade Repository. Other than that, we also had the, uh, as members of the important agreements such as the CPTPP and the, and the WTFA, the Trade Facilitation Agreement. We also had to, uh, to improve the transparency of the, of the regulations and provide uh, the commitments under the SPS and TBT chapters. And it should be noted that under CPTPP, we also even went beyond the traditional SPS and TBT chapters by having another chapter called the regulatory coherence chapter. And that provides for the use of the good regulatory practice in, uh, developing, in developing trade related regulations. And the last, and uh, and so, and the last year is now is the uh, is the SPS and TBT entry point of, of the WTO. At this stage, these entry inquiry points are working effectively in Vietnam to provide for the information on regulations in Vietnam and trade related regulations in other in partner countries. So I uh, so I believe that the the lessons that we have so far is that first. We need a strong political commitments to work in terms of the NPMs. 
uh, in uh, we cannot be uh, we cannot be satisfied just with the tariff reductions, and we need to went beyond the concern about the uh, health and customer and the environment issues, so so as to promote the streamline of the NTMs. And second, we need a good institution to set up with the coordination across the ministries and a team of the think tanks and experts to publicly review the NTM regulations. And the third one is also we need to, uh, to adhere to the international uh, good international practice in terms of how to develop uh, the reg trade related regulations. And with that, I think the uh, even in this context, we still need to be you know, to discuss a lot with the regulations related to trade during the COVID context because everyone's talking about the use of online pub, online portal for public consultations and the other and some other countries are also working on toward the sharing the practice in order to expediting the public consultation process in, in this context. And what we have to do is to ensure that the public consultation process will still be effective rather than just be shortened. Thank you. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Zong, uh, for this uh, overview um, of the efforts in uh, Vietnam on, on non-tariff measures and trade-related regulations. Um, you uh, interestingly said how the importance of non-tariff measures and the awareness has been increasing over, over the years. And um, where um, like the broader picture of a review of the business environment played an important role also to increase the, um, the awareness of the importance of non-tariff measures. Um, and you know, reducing regulatory burden was on one element that you mentioned that came out of the analysis that, that was conducted in, in Vietnam. Um, you then mentioned uh, efforts to uh, streamline regulations. So you mentioned good regulatory practices, um, which um, is an uh, important element here to, um, to um, ensure that new regulations uh, are um, fulfilling the requirements to, um, you know, to protect the health, safety, and the environment while not um, being a, a too high trade burden. Um, uh, regulatory cooperation, uh, you emphasized, um, which was uh, uh, quite an important element. And uh, you mentioned the uh, mapping of all regulations, which are now, if I understand correctly, are publicly available in Vietnam um, by um, uh, our colleagues um, from the Economic Research Institute of ASEAN and uh, Southeast Asia area. Um, and uh, we did this jointly with, with us and, and Vietnam, the government. Um, the, the, they are now publicly available um, in the National Trade Portal, which has been recently built um, in, in uh, Vietnam, uh, where you, Zong, were also a central uh, part of this, um, and the ASEAN Trade Policy Repository, which is uh, for all 10 ASEAN members um, one um, database that uh, um, shows, shows the, the regulations of the, its member states. Um, well, WTO um, entry points uh, were mentioned. That was also emphasized by Mariam, uh, the WTO uh, trade facilitation agreement um, that, uh, of course, there are certain requirements uh, from the multilateral level. Um, thank you for pointing out three, um, three takeaways. One is a strong political commitment, uh, and I, I agree with that fully. Um, the institutional setup, which is uh, important to ensure sustainable um, transparency, and the, you mentioned the international context, which, um, of course, uh, um, I, as uh, coming from the United Nations, also um, it's uh, you know, very important. Um, thank you, um, Zong. Um, Cameroon from um, Australia, uh, may I ask you what are your challenges uh, with NTMs and what are the instruments um, that you are um, using to address those challenges? Um, Cameroon, please. Thanks, Ralph, and hello, everyone, and good evening from Canberra, Australia, um, where I'm joining you from lockdown in the moment, as, as we've all um, faced at various times throughout the last couple of years. I'm really happy to be here today um, as part of this policy dialogue, and I'm looking forward to hearing um, from the other participants uh, and the discussion later on. And thank you, Unktad and Ralph, for the opportunity. I want to focus on our immediate region or my immediate region, so the, the South Pacific and Australia's engagement with the Pacific. 
Um, this also happens to be the area that I'm directly responsible for as the branch head for the economic and trade branch within the Office of the Pacific. Um, transparency is a really important uh, issue for us when it comes to non-tariff measures. And Australia has a non-tariff barrier action plan, which is a partnership between government and business to remove unjustif unjustifiable trade restrictions. So transparency is a really key pillar of this action plan. And an example of an issue for businesses wanting to trade with Australia and the Pacific is that it's not always that easy to find out what the rules are um, when people want to export into Australia and how to comply with them. And so this is, this is feedback that we get a lot from um, Pacific Island countries. And Australia, as many will know, has very stringent requirements when it comes to sanitary and phytosanitary uh, issues that as we have, um, we see biosecurity as a really crucial element for protecting our industries and the environment. I, I will talk more later, Ralph, um, about Australia's response to um, SPS and, and TPT. Internationally, we use the World Trade Organization, as has been mentioned by a number of the other panelists, to notify and inform of our own SPS and TBT, TBT requirements. Um, regionally, we use free trade agreements. So an example of this is the Pacific Agreement on Closer Economic Relations, PESA Plus. Uh, PESA Plus entered into force at the end of last year and is a, great, is a free trade agreement with eight Pacific Island countries, um, including Australia and New Zealand. And, and this will really help inform and educate businesses in Pacific, in the Pacific and in Australia, um, in terms of understanding both Australia and New Zealand's non-tariff me measures and to better facilitate trade in the region. I might leave it there just in terms of time, but I'll come back and talk a bit more about PESA Plus a little bit later on. Thanks. Thank you, Cameron. Yes, that would be nice uh, to learn a bit more about PESA Plus uh, later on, because I think that is a good example um, for regulatory cooperation, where you try to cooperate with your trading partners in the region. Um, you, you mentioned also SPS and TBT. Uh, Cameron, if I, if I may uh, continue with that one. So um, what, what, what are the importance of SPS and TBT? So before we continue possibly to discuss the challenges with NGMs um, in terms of trade costs, um, they also have a very important role to play to protect our safety, health and environment. So how, what, what's, what's the, the role of these instruments for Australia? Thanks, Ralph. Um, so SPS measures are quarantine and biosecurity measures, which are applied to protect human, animal, plant, life, or health from risks arising from the introduction and spread of pests and diseases, as, as most of us will know on the call. Um, these measures also protect against risks ari arising from additives, uh, toxins, and contaminants in food and in animal feed. One thing that I wanted to talk about today was just in terms of like the economic importance of these SPS measures for Australia. And I wanted to share a few statistics with those on the call. Uh, so in Australia, it's estimated that our biosecurity systems protect our agriculture, forestry and fisheries exports worth $51 billion to the Australian economy. Our tourism sector worth $50 billion and environment, environmental assets worth more than $5.7 trillion in Australia. And this, this has a direct impact on protecting around 1.6 million jobs in Australia. So when we talk about these systems of um, SPS and bio, um, TBT bio, um, biosecurity measures, we're really talking about protecting Australia's economy. So they're really important that we maintain those issues, uh, but um, as I'll come to a bit later on, we're also very much focused on how our Pacific neighbours and partners can access Australia's market in terms 
of their own economic development. One example that I wanted to focus on in terms of SPS is an action um, uh, that we conducted with an outbreak of citrus canker, canker, sorry, citrus canker in Australia's Northern Territory in 2018. So citrus canker affects the, the leaves, twigs and fruit of citrus plants and it causes the leaves to drop and unripe fruit, fruit to fall to the ground. So all types of citrus are affected by this disease. There was an outbreak in 2018, which was det detected in Northern Australia, in Darwin, and there's no cure for the disease. So any infected trees have to be destroyed and there needs to be a really swift response. So for plant owners in Darwin, um, they were inconvenienced. Uh, their trees uh, had to be destroyed, uh, but the real concern was that what would happen if citrus canker, canker got down to the south of Australia, where um, our big citrus growing industries are based. Um, so that would have not only decimated, decimated uh, Australia's agricultural industry, um, but it also would have uh, decimated the livelihoods of the towns that are responsible for producing those crops. In terms of technical barriers to trade, um, they protect people and the environment in Australia through standards for food packaging and labelling in terms of animal welfare, agriculture and veter veterinary chemicals, fisheries and forestry. Um, I'm, also, I'm really conscious of the time, Ralph, so I'm going to leave it there and, and pass on to the other panellists. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cameron. Um, I found that very interesting. So you uh, mentioned um, not only the uh, um, non-economic objectives with SPS and TBT, um, like of course you, you did mention them, you know, food and um, in, in food and animal feed, um, dis certain diseases uh, to protect them. Um, so this is um, the original objective of SPS, um, most SPS measures and TBT um, measures. Um, but uh, then you also mentioned the economic importance, um, you know, for for tourism and certain other sectors. So I think that that was an um, interesting uh, angle that you mentioned here. Thank you very much for 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 this. So we have in a way um, a dilemma here with non-tariff measures. So on the one hand, we have the um, importance to protect the safety, health, and the environment. Um, also on the ben beneficial side, as Cameron has just mentioned, you know, there may be other sectors that benefit also then from this. Uh, you mentioned tourism and some other sectors here, um, but they um, are a, a obstacle for traders. Um, so if we do some analysis here, um, we see that non-tariff measures are about three to four times more important than tariffs um, in terms of uh, the trade costs. So. Um, we need to have uh, instruments here to address these two sides. So on the one hand, we need non-tariff measures. They cannot be negotiated away. On the other hand, they should be uh, smart measures um, in order not to disturb trade more than uh, necessary. And uh, we have a couple of uh, uh, people here um, in the panel um, that have done tremendous effort in terms of uh, addressing those. And I would like to come to transparency first. And uh, I would like to ask you, Kutman, um, uh, you developed and introduced an, an e-governance system in the Kyrgyz Republic. And I would like to, you to tell us a bit about this because I think this is quite ahead of the curve. I would like to mention again here for those uh, participants who may have joined us a bit later, you have to choose the English channel now. So at the bottom of the page, there is a globe and you have to choose the English channel. Otherwise you will not be able to hear the, the translation because uh, Mr. Kutman will speak in Russian. So please go to the globe and choose the English channel then you are on the safe side. Um, Kutman, please. Yes, thank you, Ralph. Добрый день, коллеги. Григорий, надеюсь, все успевает с переводом. Я буду говорить чуть помедленнее. И хочу поблагодарить за то, что предоставили возможность участвовать сегодня на вебинаре и поделиться с вами с нашим опытом. И позвольте мне сегодня рассказать вам о нашей совместной разработке. 
модуля нетарифных мер регулирования для Кыргызской Республики. И в своем выступлении я хочу рассказать о предпосылках создания модуля нетарифных мер, о ходе разработки и целях, о проблемах существующих и выявленных в ходе реализации модуля и о дальнейших планах. Григорий, я извиняюсь, если я быстро говорю, вы можете остановиться. Хорошо, хорошо, спасибо. В 2017 году была проведена большая работа по выявлению нетарифных мер регулирования в Кыргызской Республике. Национальная группа экспертов прошла онлайн-курс ЮНКТАДА по применению классификационной системы. Данная группа изучила более двух с половиной тысяч документов из четырех источников и было выявлено 100 релевантных документов. В ходе анализа эксперты выявили 586 нетарифных мер, существующих у нас. Из них 217 – это национальные меры и 369 – на уровне Евразийского экономического союза. Все собранные данные экспертами в 2017 году были загружены в международную базу Trains. Так как количество применяемых мер постоянно меняется и отсюда рождается необходимость регулярно отслеживать изменения для поддержания актуальности этой информации. И в этой связи было принято решение о создании модуля нетарифных мер. Модуль который будет взаимодействовать с международной базой Trains и актуализировать все имеющуюся там информацию по Кыргызской республике. И согласно местного законодательства, модуль нетарифных мер а, так сложилось, что все системы Кыргызской республики должны работать через систему электронного взаимодействия Тундук что стало вот одним из причин создания своего отдельного модуля. Также модуль НТМ разрабатывали согласно структуре справочника нетарифных мер на базе методологии ЮНТАД. И предоставление доступа к данным в виде автоматизированных сервисов для заинтересованных сторон. В ходе разработки мы придерживались цели создания единого источника по нетарифным мерам для всех заинтересованных сторон. И в первую очередь это с базой Trains, также для таможенной службы Кыргызской Республики, для контролирующих органов нашей республики и для системы единого окна. В настоящий момент разработка модуля на этапе завершения, но уже сейчас в нем можно заполнять все существующие меры и автоматически передавать в базу Trains. В ходе реализации мы столкнулись с проблемой. В связи с сокращением количества сотрудников государственных органов, а также с текучестью кадров, у нас как бы, нет специалистов по нетарифным мерам, которые должны заполнить данный модуль и актуализировать данные по нетарифным мерам. Вопрос по наполнению и актуализации существующих нетарифных мер остается открытым. Решением, конечно, является проведение нового анализа. Но при этом необходимо учесть, что анализ должен проводиться с учетом целесообразности и необходимости новых мер. Если анализ в таком ключе будет проводиться, я считаю, будет это намного эффективнее и, возможно, выгоднее для страны. Несмотря на имеющиеся проблемы, мы планируем запустить в ближайшее время модуль НТМ и активизировать в ней все имеющиеся функции, такие как взаимодействие с базой Trains, передача сведений в систему единого окна и в систему таможенной службы, предоставление информации о существующих мерах в других странах малому и среднему бизнесу. При этом хочу отметить, что уже сейчас к нам поступают запросы от Государственной таможенной службы Кыргызской Республики о получении из этого модуля сведений о нетарифных мерах для того, чтобы они могли использовать ее при контроле импорта 
товаров на границе. И как бы в завершении своего выступления я бы хотел сказать о том, что в планах у нас еще получать сведения о нетарифных мерах от других стран. Я считаю, что основные основания получения бы я считаю, что основной как бы, момент здесь в том, что при получении сведений о других, от других стран, сведений о нетарифных мерах через базу Трейнс, мы могли бы активизировать механизм взаимодействия единых окон, единых окон между странами, так как меры – это в том числе разрешительные документы. А разрешительные документы – это в основном выдаются через систему единых, единого окна. Ну, как бы, так сказать, маленький шаг для достижения больших успехов. На этом у меня все. Всем спасибо за внимание. И готов ответить на ваши вопросы. Thank you very much, uh, Kutman. That was uh, very interesting. And um, having been part of, of your effort there, I, I can only confirm that you're really here ahead of the curve because you have built a whole e-governance system and you have included an NTM component there, um, which I would like to congratulate you to. Um, I think this is really um, excellent because you, you try to have one central database um, based on, on the um, international classification of NTMs that we have developed together with um, our partner agencies. And um, so you make this then available to all government agencies. Um, I think this is, this is quite remarkable to have this one um, you know, central database uh, using the information. Um, thank you very much. Uh, you, you emphasized also how challenges how challenging it is to co collect the NTM data. And um, I thank you for this, uh, because um, this is uh, something which we, um, though we do say that transparency is a relatively low hanging fruit, um, it is, it is uh, quite, quite an effort to, to collect those information. Um, so you, you mentioned also the challenge uh, by you know, downsizing the government employees to, um, to sustain this um, a database, um, which I understand is a big challenge, um, and the need to do, do another analysis of all the regulations. And here I would like to say again that uh, our colleagues uh, from UNECE have done a really uh, nice job in analyzing all the um, regulations um, in, in the Kyrgyz Republic, but that has been a couple of years ago, so uh, maybe there's a room to, to um, revisit this. Um, and uh, yes, so we are, we are um, uh, think it's, it's a good proposal um, to have this data exchange between trains and the national trade portal in, in Kyrgyzstan. Um, we are looking forward to this. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's a very nice example of enhancing the transparency here. Um, Mariam, um, if I may uh, come back to you, what has Georgia been undertaking to enhance the transparency um, and why is it so important for you? Thank you, Ralph. So um, first of all, I would like to emphasize that transparency and predictability plays an important role um, for engagement in international trade and Georgia pays special attention to the development of relevant mechanisms for that purpose. Few words why that is for, so important for us. Uh, we are talking today about removing unnecessary non-tariff measures and most countries are thinking how to remove these measures and in georgia we have this situation vice versa i would say because uh, in back in 2005 we have started uh, the um, uh, heavy heavy efforts to liberalize trade and by that time we have totally deregulated all the economy including trade um, just for example, uh, we have uh, abolished 85% uh, of all licenses and, and permits for, uh, for economy, including in trade-related spheres, including in SPS and TBT measures. So what are we doing today? Today we step by step are introducing new regulations 
in line with our commitments under the EU Georgia Deep and Comprehensive Free Trade Agreement. As I have mentioned, we are now approximating our legislation for you, Akis, and we try to be in this process as transparent as possible because we are introducing totally new regulations for businesses. And we try to have uh, the, cons the intensive consultation with this business sector for each legislative piece. We are doing these consultations for all important legislation, parts of legislations. And as I have already mentioned, most of our trade related uh, reforms are the dedicated to approximation of Georgia's legislation to the new keys. And in that process, we have several, we have developed several formal consultation mechanisms for businesses. I can name a few of them. Let's say under the Ministry of Economy and Sustainable Development, we have created the trade advisory group, which uh, proved to be a successful platform for consultation with businesses. We have also created for better informational coverage, we have created the CFTA Go G web portal where you can find all the CFTA related information. And what is most important on that web portal, we are all draft trade related draft legislation are posted before adoption in order to have consultations with all the interested parties. And only after those consultations, the drafts are adopted by the government of Georgia or by the parliament of Georgia. Also, this DCFTA web portal have a special uh, page for businesses. And on that page, you can find all the information what are the government services that is necessary uh, for exporting uh, products to the EU market and worldwide and how you can get those services and many other information about, about product safety requirements and so on. Our aim is to be as transparent as possible inside of the country and outside of the country. And I would like to thank UNCAD, which helps us and in that regards, we are now very actively cooperating on Georgia's NTM's data collection and their integration into UNCTAD's online global database on NTM's. The aim of this project is to strengthen the transparency in trade and develop national experts' capacity. And finally, I would like to highlight that findings from the UNEC study both before and after the pandemic show that traders were well informed about NTMs in Georgia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mario. Was this positive note that is um, good to hear? Um, so uh, thank you very much, Mariam, for emphasizing the transparency efforts. Um, you mentioned in particular new measures uh, where it is very important to uh, be transparent. And as we know, uh, Georgia is in a reform process, so that plays an important role for you. Um, thank you very much for this. Um, Zong, um, very briefly, um, you mentioned the um, national trade portal in Vietnam um, in the interest of time. Is there anything um, you could uh, elaborate on this, please? Uh, I think the, uh, in, uh, in the ASEAN, ASEAN economic integration process, uh, there is uh, there's also a commitment for, member, uh, for members to develop the trade repository. And with that, uh, it, it aimed to reflect an ASEAN trade repository and, another, and the separate system of national portals at the country level. And in Vietnam, there has been a, a number of efforts to develop the, the portal in this. And uh, the Ministry of Industry and Trade is now working on the portal for this. But other than that, there, is, uh, there has been other efforts to provide the portal with access to trade, such as the trade information portal, which is currently managed by the uh, uh, General Department of Custom in Vietnam uh, with the with, um, and it was developed by the World Bank. And I think it was the, the set of uh, uh, information that can be accessed by the trade by the traders uh, in in order to get prepared and then uh, uh, and and then accordingly reduce the you know, trade costs in undertaking the trade activities in ASEAN with, and especially in the case of Vietnam in the case of Vietnam. 
Thank you very much, uh, Zong. Um, so transparency, we have heard from uh, our, our speakers um, is very important. And we have heard uh, about steps to um, improve the transparency. Transparency can prevent many misunderstandings on non-tariff measures. Still, sometimes uh, non-tariff barriers uh, remain. Um, and uh, um, our um, colleague, uh, Mr. Silver from the um, African Free Trade um, uh, AFCFTA Secretariat uh, was supposed to join us, but he has technical issues. So it's very unfortunate that he cannot join us. Um, but uh, we have Mrs. Kuena Malopo here, um, who um, agreed to, to step in in the last minute and to tell us a little bit about the non-tariff barriers mechanism in Africa, which is um, really ahead of the curve um, to address non-tariff barriers in a, in a whole continent. Um, thank you very much, Kuena. Kuena is based in the um, AFC FTA Secretariat. Um, and uh, I, my understanding is correct that Silva is not here. Right. OK, yeah. Rina, please. Hello. Good morning. Uh, good morning, uh, Ralph, and uh, good morning, uh, colleagues and everyone um, on the on the on the webinar this morning. I would just like to take this opportunity to just apologize on behalf of uh, Mr. Sylvester Ojako, who uh, tried uh, really uh, persistently to, to join, but uh, he has been experiencing some technical uh, problems, but he passes his apologies um, and he has requested me to speak uh, on his behalf. And um, I just want to say, uh, uh, acknowledge that uh, along with uh, the many instruments that were launched with the launch of the African continental free trade area of importance was the AFCFTA and online NTB mechanism, which was meant or has been uh, uh, developed to create a platform for interaction and exchange between member states to be able to talk on issues that are NTBs and that may pose as NTBs. Uh, so today, even as we are discussing uh, the legitimacy of uh, NTMs, we know that there are those that uh, at one point or another become a barrier, um, whether it is of a technical nature or it is of an, an, an administrative uh, nature. So the, NT, uh, the FCFT NTB mechanism has been established as a platform where economic operators, business, small and big, can uh, uh, record or report whatever challenge they're facing on the ground in order for wherever they are facing them or the governments of the, the territories they are facing them are able to see them and re respond to them. So this has given us or is giving us an opportunity to quickly respond to some of the challenges that the uh, economic operators um, are going through. Uh, this was launched uh, in 2019 and it started uh, to be functioning uh, to be functional uh, uh, on the 13th of January 2020 and so far we have received uh, about three uh, this is uh, because uh, trade has not yet started but it will be starting um, uh, soon while it is being worked on this platform already exists to respond to the needs of the economic operators in the African uh, continent. Um, the AFCFT NTB mechanism is found on um, tradebarriers.africa. If you would like to visit it, you will see there's a number of um, uh, uh, manuals and information available on it uh, for everyone to be able to use it uh, effectively. Uh, I would like to uh, leave it on uh, at, at this point. Uh, uh, to to give any opportunity for any questions if they are available. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Quina. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a pity that uh, Silva can't join us, but I really appreciate that you come in and uh, tell us about the um, AFC FTA efforts and the NTB mechanism, which is really remarkable. I mean, traders can at the border, you know. I mean, small traders can at the border send a text message using their mobile phone. And then this um, complaint 
uh, has to be taken up by the country that is supposed to 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 have this uh, barrier. Um, yeah. So this is this is really remarkable, and I haven't seen this in any other region. So um, I, I wish uh, I wish Africa um, good luck uh, using this instrument also to to uh, strengthen the regional integration. Thank you, Quena. Thank you. Um, we have. Uh, couple of questions here, um, though our time is up. Um, if you allow me, I will just continue perhaps for three minutes. Um, there is a question to Cameroon. Um, uh, Cameroon, um, Australia has many um, uh, trade agreements um, with um, other countries. And that brings us to the last um, uh, technique that we have indicated here as, as an instrument uh, to address non-tariff uh, measures and the challenges with non-tariff measures. So what is Australia doing in the Pacific region to address non-tariff measures on corporate and international standards and technical regulations? Um, perhaps uh, Cameroon, if you could uh, be relatively brief on this, but I think that is an in interesting question which has also been raised here in the question and answer box uh, by Mr. Sergei. Thank you, Ralph. And thanks for the, the question from Mr. Sergei. Um, so, I'll be brief, but just to focus in on, on, I guess, this question in relation to our work in the Pacific. So as I said before, we um, have just uh, entered into force the, the PESA Plus Agreement. So that includes eight Pacific Island countries, including Australia and New Zealand. And it's very much a development-centered free trade agreement. So it's a free trade agreement covering the Pacific region on goods, services, trade, investment, and the movement of natural persons. But it has a really strong development focus and includes a chapter on development and economic cooperation. Um, and there's also uh, an accompanying implementation arrangement. And so this provides a framework for, for members of the trade agreement to um, identify priorities and evaluate progress throughout the implementation. So going to the question, um, you know, we will be evaluating through the development cooperation um, how the free trade agreement itself and, and the supporting structures, and there's $25 million of ODA support that is provided to um, the Pacific countries to, to um, facilitate trade, to improve um, uh, kind of regulation, to, to work with private sector, to improve increase capacity in the Pacific to um, respond to um, uh, trade settings across the region. Uh, and so we'll use that to monitor how both where the sticking points are. So, you know, in terms of non-trade, but um, non-tariff measures, where, where those issues are and how we can resolve them in, through kind of increased support around both capacity, but also um, part of the free trade agreement brings officials from relevant um, ministries. So for example, in Australia, it brings our um, Department of Agriculture uh, colleagues from uh, Australia's Department of Agriculture and, and includes um, colleagues from around the Pacific and their relevant ministries. And we also kind of wrap around um, other programs of development and economic support that that really um, support that effort. So one last point, or two two other two other points. So as part of this uh, um, PACE Plus free trade agreement, there's an implementation unit that is responsible for um, delivering that twenty five million dollars of development and economic cooperation, and and that team um, helps identify a work program that's kind of consulted very much with the officials in the Pacific, and then monitors that work program. Um, the other point I will make is that we have, um, again, together with Australia and New Zealand, a program called the Pacific Horticultural and Agricultural Market Access Program, or for short, Pharma Plus. And this is very much about working with countries in the Pacific um, to help manage the re regulatory aspects associated with um, exporting um, um, and primary goods and products and exporting them to other markets around the world, including Australia and New Zealand, understanding the, those um, 
biosecurity SPS TBT issues and bringing together um, officials from the relevant departments and from private sector um, and, and really helping the kind of forming a link between government, and private sector, and including under the, the frame of PESA plus free trade agreement to um, get increased access to, to markets around the world, including Australia and New Zealand. So hopefully that goes to, to some of the question. I know it was kind of like how how is um, how do free trade agreements support um, kind of greater economic growth and access to um, around these issues? And I guess the, the answer to that is, you know, we're going to continue to monitor that and hold ourselves to account through this development cooperation and work program. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, um, Cameron, for that. I think uh, you made a couple of important and interesting points. Uh, one was the coordination with the partners within the PESA Plus agreement, which uh, includes Australia, New Zealand, and I believe eight or nine uh, Pacific Islands. Um, so, but also you mentioned the coordination within the government. So you mentioned the various ministries, which I think we all know is a challenge in all countries uh, because they have different responsibilities that may partly overlap. So I think that was a very um, important point. And you, you made also another important point, which is the implementation. So a free trade agreement may be signed, well, not easily, we know it takes years and years to negotiate, but um, that's only, only part of the um, entire process. So then implementing it really is a, is a big challenge. And uh, you, you mentioned um, some of the efforts that you are doing to, to support um, the, the countries to really um, uh, implement those agreements. Um, for example, you mentioned the market access program, Pharma Plus, um, which I think falls into this, uh, this, this area. Thank you very much. I think that was, that was very, very interesting. Um, in terms of uh, regional uh, cooperation, there's also um, the uh, Eurasian Economic um, Agreement, um, the EAEU, um, uh, of which the Kyrgyz Republic is member. And there's one question um, here in the chat box, um, whether the efforts in the Kyrgyz Republic um, will uh, be able to extend to, to other um, EAEU members. Um, I don't know, Mr. Kutman, um, is there any... Um, any interest uh, from you to extend this uh, to the other uh, members um, to make this a regional effort? Um, the example that you have given with the e-governance and uh, sharing the um, information on NTMs. Передавать данные, да, мы собираемся э, получать и передавать э, данные по нетарифным мерам Кыргызской Республики, в том числе э, все нетарифные меры, которые э, Евразийским экономическим союзом. Вот. Так что мы планируем и уже сейчас закладываем такую возможность в этом модуле, чтобы мы могли обмениваться с базой Trends, не только передавать, но также и получать. Сам модуль написан на открытом исходном коде, то есть и данный модуль могут, в принципе, использовать и другие страны для формирования да, и для взаимодействия с базой Trends. Вопрос, будет ли, предположим, Казахстан или Россия использовать, ну, я не могу ответить, но, в принципе, ограничений на использование никаких мы не ставим. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Kutman. And uh, um, uh, yeah, I think um, we could very much use your um, your development um, of the, the trade portal um, as a good practice for the region. And uh, you know, we, we hope that we have an opportunity uh, together with our colleagues from UNECE to continue to support you and to um, enlarge this uh, within the EAEU uh, region. I think this is definitely something that we, that we should explore. Thank you very much for this. Um, so uh, yeah, there are some, some more questions in the chat box, but in the interest of time, um, I think we will uh, not be able um, 
to answer all those questions. Um, one, one question is on uh, for, for, for Vietnam, and uh, that is a question, um, again, uh, linked to regional coordination um, uh, within the ASEAN region, that is uh, from our colleagues from AREA. Um, thank you very much for, for that question. Um, so um, I would like to uh, close the session now. I think we have had a very um, interesting discussion here. Um, and uh, yeah, I would like to thank all panelists, um, Mariam, uh, Zong, Cameron, Kutman, and Kuena for stepping in in the last moment. Um, thank you also very much to Aladi for the keynote address and for our uh, interpreter, uh, Gregory. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, last but not least, I would like to thank also my team and uh, my colleagues from the trade negotiations branch for um, having made this uh, um, webinar um, possible. So I think we have uh, had a really good discussion about the challenges of NTMs and some of the um, uh, instruments that can address those challenges, um, including transparency, which was discussed a lot, um, uh, the non-tariff barriers mechanism in Africa, which is a bit of a different approach, um, very, very interesting and uh, very, um, very modern, I find. Um, and also regulatory cooperation was uh, um, emphasized uh, several times. So um, thank you very much, um, everybody. And uh, we are looking forward to um, uh, continue the discussion in this or other fora um, with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye.